Yesterday we had to answer how fast the water level rising. Somewhere along the way we computed the volume of the water when the height is 6. So this over here, the volume, when the height is 6, that is not the answer to the question. That is other information. I might ask about something like two different things, but you want to make sure you read the actual question and see what I'm asking about. So this was our change in height over change in time. So that was the question to the, or the answer to the original question. And now we're gonna get started on the second problem. So again, you can just leave some space in your notes, however much it will take you to copy this down and then uh, write down what I write and come and copy down the problem later. So we have a hot air balloon rising straight up from a field, and we're tracking it with a rangefinder. And it's 500 feet from the liftoff point. At the moment, the rangefinder's elevation angle is pi over 4. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. So right there, I know that we're measuring the angle in radians. Not because there was a pi over 4. Remember, you can have weird problems where your degree measurement has multiple pi in it. So that doesn't tell me we're in radians. What tells me we're in radians is 0.14 radians per minute. So that's what actually tells me that we're in radians. So if that was degrees per minute, we'd be dealing with a weird angle, pi over 4 degrees, which is a very tiny angle. It's like smaller than 1 degree. So it's important to know what units you're going to be measuring in. Uh, also, by default, if I don't say anything, we're measuring in radians as well. Uh, now, you don't, because we're measuring in radians, if I just don't write that right there, and I just write angle units per minute, that's a little bit weird. So it makes a lot of sense, that one, to write radians per minute. Uh, how fast is the balloon rising at the moment? So we need some, we can either start with a picture, drawing our picture, or we can start by uh, writing out what variables we so we'll start with the picture hot air balloon rising straight up from a level field so we'll just take one of these lines as the field that's our level field hot air balloon is rising straight up so we'll just draw an up arrow so range finder 500 feet from the liftoff point so we're going to go over some amount and this will be 500 And we have a range finder. I don't know how to draw that. I'll just draw it as a sort of stick figure thing. Probably looks something like a camera or a telescope, I guess. So there's our range finder. At the moment, the range finder's elevation is pi over 4, which is 45 degrees. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 rads per minute. All right, so our hot air balloon is going straight up on this arrow. And at the moment that we're considering, the rangefinder is looking at the hot air balloon and is making a 45 degree angle, or pi over 4. So we have a hot air balloon. Or a light bulb uh, going up. So we have to decide what is changing. So is that pi over 4 going to be changing? Is that value constant? Nope. The hot air balloon is increasing in, uh, or is, what do we say, rising. So there's no way that angle is going to stay pi over 4. So I need a variable. And generally, go with data for your angle. So your trig feels more familiar. You could say your angle is x or y or some other letter, but I recommend go with data. If you got two angles, your second one can be phi, which is a sideways theta. It's another good letter for an, if you need two angles. So is this number 500 changing right here? That's the distance from the takeoff point to the little measuring device. So that's constant. So I don't want to use another variable for that. So 500 is constant. You don't have to write constant next to it, but if you don't use a variable for it, that means it's going to be constant. So there's something else that I need to keep track of. 
and I haven't written a variable or a number down for that. So we got a height, which is, uh, they're not asking about the height, but how fast is a balloon rising is definitely related to the height. So we need a height, and we'll go with H. That works for height. Y would be another really good second choice for that variable. Actually, we'll use Y. Why not? So the reason we have to use variables is because the height is changing. It's going to be increasing. So I cannot just put a number in there. How do I relate Y, 500, and theta? You just took this class last quarter. So we're going to use trigonometry. What, which of the six trig functions could I use? I don't know a hypotenuse, so that throws away most of them. Tangent or cotangent? So let's do tangent. I usually go with one of the first three instead of the reciprocal. Uh, so we got tangent theta. And it's going to be opposite, which is y, over adjacent which is 500. So that's relating tangent with y and 500. How many actual variables do we have? Two. There's two. There's three things that are related, but one of them is constant. So there's only two variables. So this is perfect. You want two variables. Sometimes you have to deal with three, but in this case, whenever you can, get down to two. So we're already at two variables. What am I trying to find? What question? Are we answering how fast is a balloon rising at this moment? How fast? What represents the speed or the velocity? Derivative, Derivative <laughs> of which variable? So it's d over d. So there's only two variables. So it's either theta or y. So this is going to be change in height. So that's d. Whoa. That's not right. Y goes on the top. What goes on the bottom? Oh, no. All right, so how fast? You can see the units. This is radians per minute. So I need per time. So I'm going to go with uh, our velocities can be measured per minute if we don't change units. So it's going to be dy dt. Always go T for time, even if you might be tempted to go M for minutes. You'll probably think meters or slopes or something weird like that. So keep your time units, you know, or keep your time variable T. All right, so this is the upwards velocity. And why is it the upwards velocity? Because it's a derivative of the vertical position. So the derivative of the position is the velocity, and if we're counting vertical, so it's going to be the vertical velocity or the upwards velocity. All right, and one other thing I haven't used yet. We got our theta is pi over 4, but this rate information that we were given, I haven't used that yet. So 0.14 rads per minute. What is that measuring? What variable? Is this sort of getting closer? This is d theta over dt. So that tells us how the angle is changing over time. So I think we've written down everything and set up the picture correctly. So once you have this done, your related two variables, you take a t derivative, or a ddt derivative. So I've written the procedure down. Nope. Probably time to do that. So let's write the general procedure over here on the right side. Okay. 
So step one, draw a diagram. And included in this is write down variables. And also included in writing down variables is also their d, dt derivatives. If you have a variable, it's going to change over time. If your variable is not changing over time, it's not a variable, it's a constant. So every time variables and constants. And once you have set everything, and then of course relate them. So relate variables and constants in an equation. Once you have everything set up, take d dt of the equation, then plug in values. And last, solve for solve for term in the original problem, or in the question. So we did our draw, draw diagram, row time variables constants. We related them in our one equation. So our relating step is right here, that equation. So ready to actually do calculus. So we're going to take a d dt of this equation. And I'm going to rewrite the right side. This is 1 over 500 times y. You don't want to use the quotient rule here. That would be very much overkill. You could use a quotient rule on the right side, but you absolutely don't need to. Whoa, that's tangent theta, not tangent y. All right, take this derivative. Remember, you're going to get an extra d theta dt on the left and extra dy dt on the right. So don't forget about the chain rule. You're getting extra piece on each side. And if you forgot derivative of tangent, maybe your neighbor remembered. And the derivative of y is just 1. There's our derivative of secant squared times derivative of theta. Multiplication is commutative, so it's up to you. Yeah, you can change the order around. Uh, one time, you don't want to change the order. <coughs> so multiplication is commutative. Taking a derivative, that operation is not commutative. So. What I'm talking about is commutativity. So you got multiplication, you can change the order. So for example, in our problem, we had uh, 1 over 500 d theta dt. That was multiplying two things, so I can change this order. So these are the same thing. However, uh, this is uh, derivatives are not commutative operators.
They operate on what's to their right. They operate on their right. So we know how to take this derivative. We just, uh, it was, yeah, times y. So this is 1 over 500. GDT of Y so that's the regular way to do calculus just a constant multiple rule uh, now let me do some really bad calculus this doesn't really make sense because our operator is looking on its right side on as to what to operate on. So this operator is hanging around with nothing to actually take a derivative of. So it wouldn't make sense to even write this. So right here I would need an expression or an equation here. So this is definitely very different from DDT of that right there. So the one on the right doesn't make any sense because the operator is, has nothing that it's going to operate on. So does that help out a little bit? The other uh, issue with notation, so if I go up here, and we'll look at this a little more closely. I want to compare just what's in these parentheses right here. So in the upper parentheses, that's an operator that operates on what's to the right. So that's an operator. And this is the what we call the operand. That's the thing that gets operated on. On the second line, it's already finished the operation. So it's no longer an operator. So here we finish the operation. What we're looking at is the result. Down there. So that's the, the finished product of that operation. Products, maybe not the right word, but that's the output of that operation is what you see. So it's no longer an operator. It's not waiting for something else. If and you, oh, if you were going to like to visualize it, if you put that operator as like the definition of a derivative, would it be <coughs> as it approaches like zero or infinity or whatever? Yeah, so, so in, an, in a, another opera, uh, operator you saw is a limit. Uh, although a limit, well, it can give you functions too. Uh, our derivative uh, was a difference quotient that gave us a fun uh, function, the derivative function. Uh, so if you think of limits, lim, go t approaches 0 of some uh, it may just be f of t but this will uh, if your function is continuous it's f of 0 but the idea is it gives you something that no longer has a limit inside of it so you you apply the limit operator and it turns into generally it'll turn into a number sometimes another function uh, but there will be no, you don't keep writing limit. At some point, when you actually operate and take that limit, you'll no longer write lim, lim, lim. Maybe an easier example is uh, the first line, we're talking about something like a sine function of y. And on the second line, it's the value. So you take y and plug it into the sine function and get some value out. So if I put some number here instead, like pi over 4, 
And then the next line, what is sine pi over 4? That is 1 over square root 2. That's the value, the output you get. So you don't see there's no more sine function. It disappeared because it already operated on the angle. So we got no sine function because it's done operating. The only tricky thing with derivatives, aside from that they operate in a weird way that we just learned about, is that it still sort of keeps something that looks like the original form. Our notation doesn't change much. That's the only tricky part. The notation looks super similar. In fact, how similar? Literally, the y moved over a centimeter. That's the difference. What's the difference between these two right here? the y moved from where you see it to right there. That's the only difference notationally between the two. And that's why derivatives are, can be really tricky to write down. They mean something absolutely completely different. However, they're also equal. So hopefully I didn't completely confuse you there. So the, you, when we are used to applying functions, they generally disappear completely. So there's no, there's nothing here anymore that looks similar to sine. But that's not the case with derivatives. Uh, however, if I took a y derivative, this would turn into 1. So sometimes. It is the case. It all depends, unfortunately. Uh, this part of it, it, the notation part can be confusing. And of course, we can write it, to make things worse, we can write it as 1 over 500 y prime. There's another way to write it. So you can make the derivative look a lot different than the operator looked originally. So we related everything together. We took our derivative. So we're going to plug in the values now. So I know theta. Do I need to know the y value? Just looking down here, do I actually need to know the y value to figure out, um, well, is y even appearing in here? So I see a y, but what is that right there? Is that the height, or is that something else? It's not the height. What is that? Velocity. It's a velocity. It's a change in the height. So I don't actually need to figure out the height. That's not uh, needed right here. Now, if, I, if this was a y squared, I would have gotten something different. It still had an extra y hanging around. That'd be a different story. But y completely disappeared, so I don't have to figure out the y value. It's not hard to do. You can do it in a couple seconds if you know geometry. What type of triangle do we have? It's a right triangle. What's the smart people word for this type of triangle? Isosceles. Definitely not a five anything. It's 500 if it's anything. Um, but it's an isosceles. We've got the same uh, angles, so we'd have a 500 height as well. However, that's not needed. Um, and how else can you get the height? You got it right here. You just plug in pi over 4 for theta, and you'll get the height right away. Tangent pi over 4 is 1, so 1 equals y over 500. So y will equal 500. What do I actually want to find? How fast is the balloon rising? Upwards velocity, dy dt. So this is what we're trying to find. Let's solve dy, or circle dy dt. We want to find this. All we have to do is multiply by 500, plug in all of our values. So we're almost there. So let's go ahead and well, I'll do my algebra first, then I'll plug in values. And secant squared is 1 over cosine squared. You can leave it as secant squared. I just like to think in the terms of the first three trig 
functions instead of the reciprocals. I'll just write y prime. And we know theta is pi over 4. So I'll just write the values we're plugging in. Theta is pi over 4. And d theta dt, 0.14. So this is cos pi over 4 squared times 0.14. Cos pi over 4 is 1 over square 2 squared is 1 half. Reciprocated is 2. So we get 1,000 times 0.14, which is 140. Move it over 3, 140. Did I do any bad arithmetic? Hopefully not. So 140, and if you actually are into science, you probably care about units. So it's 140. What units will we be measuring in? What units was Y measured in? We didn't really write it down. So I said Y would be 500 also, because we had an equilateral triangle, but 500 what? We measure the other in feet, so this is going to be feet. You're not going to have a base of feet and a height of miles. Not if they're both 500, certainly, in this triangle. So this is feet, so that's feet, upwards velocity. So this is in feet, well, I shouldn't write equals, upwards velocity in feet per minute. And the per minute was determined by the uh, rate, how we measured the original rate. So if that was per second, I'd be in feet per second. That'd be a very fast balloon. But if we're per hour, that would be feet per hour. So it's all about the rate, the units of time were chosen by the original rate that we were given. So we get 140. That's in feet per minute. I'm not going to make a big deal in math class about units. But if you are especially going into science, then units are a really big deal. Didn't they crash the Mars rover a, a while ago because somebody used miles and somebody else went kilometers or something like that? Yeah. So you got to be very careful with units. Yeah, so cos uh, pi over 4 is 1 over square root 2. So there's our cosine. So if you square it, you get 1 half. And then I reciprocated it and got 2. So, so I have to solve for what's in the blue. I'm trying to solve for dy dt. So how do I get this out of there? I could, I could divide by the reciprocal of 1 over 500, but it's way easier to multiply by 500. So there's, there's multiplying 500 onto the left side. And then secant is 1 over cosine. So I just made that swap. I could have left it in secant, but I'm not terribly great at secant. So I just, I have the first three trig functions. Mem those are the ones I work with. So I just avoid secants by writing in 1 over cosines. Um, I mean, I could have, you could have just written secant pi over 4 is square root 2 and went that way. And then you just square, square that, and you get 2. That would have worked just as well.
So this next problem is a police chase. When you watch police chases, who do you cheer for? <laughs> You're a bad person too. All right, so we're watching a police chase and we noticed a police cruiser is approaching a right angle intersection from the north and is chasing a speeding car that has home in the corner and is now moving straight east. So we can already draw this intersection. It looks like a plus sign. So right angled intersection. So we got one road vertical, one road horizontal. So that's easy. The Police cruiser is approaching from the north. And it's going downwards. All right, this point is definitely moving, so not constant. So I need a variable for it. What is a good variable for this? Pretty much pick any letter except for D or T. T's for the derivative, T's for time. Y. Oh, Y is very good. I was thinking Y or P for police, but I think Y will make the most, most sense. So it's also on the Y axis, so that's very convenient. The other car is now moving east. So here's the other car. It's moving east. What's a good variable for this? It's moving, so it's going to need a variable. Oh, let's go with X. C is not a good variable for uh, something changing. I try to avoid C only because if, if I, when I got down to it, if I saw a DDT of C, I would probably say zero. However, if C is not a constant, this is DC over DT. So C might be a good letter to avoid as well. Uh, pi is another really bad letter to use because pi has a constant value. There's some letters that are not great to use. So we've got things moving. So they say when the cruiser is 0.6 miles north of the intersection. So what that means, y has a value, it's 0.6. How do I represent the fact that it's moving? They say the cruiser is moving at 60 miles per hour, and I'll do these in blue. How do I represent that with the variable y? Well, I have an arrow pointing downwards to represent that. But in terms of actual calculus, and uh, if I want to write 60 equals something, what is the something over here? It's not 60 equals y. That's not right. Yeah, that's dy dt. It tells us how the position or the height is changing. And how are we measuring our units? MPH. What is the H for? That's per hour. So this is in miles per hour. So you want to make sure all of our measurements are in miles. So we're 0.6 miles away. And we're measuring our speed also in miles, well, our speed is in miles per hour. But you'd have problems if your speed was given in miles per hour and then your distances were given in feet or kilometers or something. I know science classes love to give you those type of problems where you have to convert all your units. And that's a very big deal. What is the problem with the picture I drew and having dy dt equals 60? Which direction will y be moving? If dy dt equals 60, up. So over time, y would be increasing if it was positive 60. So y would be going that way, which might be good for the criminal, but not good for the math of the problem. How do I change this problem around? Or not the problem. How do I, don't change the problem. Uh, how do I change this around so it's going the right direction? Negative 60. So you want to go down. Decrease the y uh, value. Wouldn't it, the cops slow down too if it's between the corner? Eventually. Probably not 0.6 miles away. Oh, okay. Maybe they're even speeding up at that point. Who knows? Uh, that would be speaking of the acceleration, though. Oh. 
So we don't need that to answer. Uh, we don't need the acceleration in this problem. Okay. All right, so our cruiser six mi 0.6 miles north. Car is 0.8 east. I'm trying to keep my uh, rate of change in blue and then things that are not, uh, not rate of change in the regular black color. So our x is 0.8, that was 0.8 miles east. The police determined the radar distance between them and the car is increasing at 20 miles per hour. Have I drawn the distance between the police cruiser and the car? No, not yet. So we need to draw that distance. D is a tempting letter to use, but that's not a good one. So I think the next best one is H for hypotenuse. D we're going to use for derivatives, so don't go D for a distance. So we have a right angle or a right triangle. So the distance between them and the car is increasing at 20 miles per hour. So how do we write that out, that rate? Yep, dh over dt is increasing at, so that means positive 20. So they're getting further apart. So the distance is going to be growing. So that's positive 20. And what else? Cruiser is moving, got that. Speed of the car. All right, so they're asking, what's the speed of the car? So what are they actually asking about? So what are we trying to find? What is the speed of the car? So what variable represents car's position? So how do we take the car's position x and get the velocity or the speed? Derivative. So we're going to find dx over dt. Now they're asking about the speed, so they want the absolute value of this. So we're going to find dx dt and then take the absolute value at the very end. Drawing, uh, just going off the picture, it looks like the derivative should be positive because it's moving to the right. So the way we've laid everything out, we w shouldn't need the absolute value here. So I've done everything except relate our three variables. How do I relate these three variables? So this is step one, I called it, somewhere. That's step one, draw a diagram, relate everything. Step, well. Relate the variables. We're still in step one. So who can relate x, y, and h? What's the oldest theorem you know? Pythagorean theorem, can we use it here? Yeah, yeah. We got a right triangle and we got all three sides. So use Pythagorean theorem and relate the three sides. And H is hypotenuse. That's why I chose H. I think they use C for the third side, for the hypotenuse side. Not necessarily the best to use if you're going to be doing calculus. So before I said it'd be really nice if you related two variables instead of three. Let's think about the information that we have. I know, I know the rate of change of y. I know the rate of change of h. I want to find the rate of change of x. So I already know two of the three rates of change. So in this problem, I don't need to get it down to two variables because I know two rates of change. There is one value that I don't know. I know the y value, I know the x value, I don't know the h value. So how do I figure out the h value? Yeah, I already have the equation written out, I just got to plug in the values and figure out what it is. So before we do calculus, we're going to need the h value, so find h. So find the actual h value. Don't take derivative, just find the h value by plugging in.
So H is 1. You can stay with decimals if you're a decimal person. And remember, fractions only suck if you don't have common denominators. If you got common denominators, you don't you really need that much brain power to get through your fractions. <coughs> All right, so H is 1. So this makes sense to scale because the other ones are a little shorter than 1, so H is very reasonable to be 1. All right, we are finished relating everything. What do you do after everything is related? Derivative. So we're going to take a t derivative now. Every single question in this section is a ddt derivative, no matter what. All right, take ddt and plug in all the values. And I'll give you two minutes to finish this up and answer any questions that you have. And remember, what you're trying to find is dx dt. So take derivative, find dx dt. We've done lots of derivatives like this before. You mean square root of one? Uh, yeah. Like yeah. Okay. Which is one. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I forgot about that. Or I did, I did, maybe didn't forget, I just didn't mention it. <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't one, I'd be in trouble. Or zero. if you use fractions instead of decimals when you're plugging your values, depending if you're, if you're a decimal person, it may not help you. And if you want to save a little time, write h prime, y prime, and x prime instead of dx dt, dy dt, dh dt. It's up to you which of the two ways you want to write derivatives. It doesn't matter to me. If you find this more confusing, write it as dh dt. If you're OK with prime notation, it's a little faster to write down. Remember, what happens if you plug in values first before your derivative? What will you get? Zero. You get 0. You'll probably get the equation 0 equals 0, which doesn't tell you much. You probably knew that before you came to math class. So now we'll plug in all the variables. So our x was 8 tenths. x prime something. Oh, that's what we need to find. y is 6 tenths, y prime is negative 60,
And did anybody get the answer, the reduced answer? Or did I make a mistake already? I'm really bad at division. I'll reduce though. is 70. And if you're into units, it's the same units the other uh, derivatives were measured in, which is miles per hour. So we have one more problem that we'll work on, and then we're into linearization, which we'll go through really, really quickly. You've already pretty much done it. And we'll be out of linearization real fast and into chapter four.